Podcast, episode number four, where today we're going to be talking about three things that every jazz musician should practice. I'm going to go through that in much more detail in a second, but before I do, I just want to let you know that all the music on today's show is by Camden Hughes, our founder of Learn Jazz Standards, and it's from his new album, Introspective. So if you like his music, and even if you want to maybe purchase his album, uh, go ahead and go to camdenhughes.com, and you can find his music there. And if you're listening to the show on the website, you'll be able to find uh, the link to that in our show notes. And one more little item of business before we get started. If you find value in our podcast and you get something out of it, consider putting value back in it. We are dedicated to running this podcast ad-free um, in order to... Um, pay for the production of this podcast. Uh, we are relying solely on you, our listeners, to help us produce this podcast. So if you enjoy what we're doing, if you're getting value out of the information in this podcast, um, we encourage you to donate. Um, you can donate uh, if you're listening to this on the website. There's a donate button right under the player. Um, and if you're not, you can go to learnjazzstandards.com slash support to uh, help support this podcast and keep it going. And without further ado, let's talk about these three things that I think every jazz musician should practice. Um, and before I go into it, let me just say as well that I'm leaving out um, one that we always preach on this podcast, always preach on this web this website, which is learn jazz standards. Obviously, we've always said if you've followed our blog, if you follow this website at all, that learning jazz standards is really important as a jazz musician. You need to do that. Learning the repertoire, learning the history, um, learning the common um, vehicles, and the language that we use to play this music. So. Always learn jazz standards. But these three things are, are things that I truly believe are incredibly powerful for helping you become a better jazz musician and, and really make some effective changes in your playing. There's a lot of things to practice. And ultimately, the things that you practice um, should be influenced by what instrument you play technique for example a trumpet player is going to want to practice some different things technique wise than a, than a piano player perhaps so you, there's a lot of things you can be practicing but these three specific things have to do with jazz so any jazz musician any jazz player doesn't matter what instrument you're playing these three things are incredibly effective for really taking your playing to the next level so um, I, I encourage you to do these three things I'm gonna go into them right now let's check them out Okay, so the first thing that every jazz musician should be practicing is learning jazz solos by ear. Okay, this to me is one of the most effective ways to really, you know, improve your solos, improve your jazz music in general. I can't really recommend this enough. For me, learning jazz solos was a huge game changer. So before I went to college, um, right after high school, I actually took a year um, off. You know, I didn't go to school. I was kind of in between. And I just studied with the teacher. Um, and one thing that he had me do every week was learn 32 uh, new bars of a solo every week. And so I would learn those 32 bars. I'd be able to play them on my instrument. I'd be able to play them with the recording. And every Saturday, I'd go um, and have a lesson with my teacher. And I would play those 32 bars for him by memory with the recording. Um, and for me, that was something that really jump-started my playing a lot. Uh, I, I really improved that year from doing that. And, and it was a lot of work. I'll tell you that much. I spent a lot of time doing this, especially at the beginning when learning things by ear was a little bit more of a challenge for me. As I continued to do it, it got easier. But at first, it was, it was a little bit difficult. Um, and so this is so important and and learning jazz language is so important as a jazz musician and this is this is what this is doing we're learning jazz language by learning these solos by ear um, it's important to learn jazz language because that's how we're going to communicate effectively in this genre 
okay? Um, jazz language um, is obtained best by ear, not by actually reading it. Um, historically, that's how people learn things. You know, back in the bebop era, um, and even to this day, jazz musicians are picking up things by ear. They're learning melodies by ear. They're learning little little snippets of, of jazz language by ear, licks, uh, entire solos even. So it's important to do this. Um, there are some challenges, like I was just talking about before, of learning jazz language. Um, if you don't have a really developed ear, it can be a little bit challenging. And that's why I would encourage you to find solos, um, especially when you're starting, that aren't so difficult. Um, a great one that I always suggest to all my students is Miles Davis' solo on Freddie Freeloader from the album Kind of Blue. You, you all probably have heard that one before. It's a really easy solo to learn. Um, it's not very hard to hear. You can learn it by ear fairly easily. So I would suggest, you know, starting out with a solo like that and moving up from there. You know, don't pick a solo that, you know, you have a really hard time hearing all the notes and where they're going. You know, start small and, and get a bigger as time progresses. Um, and just quickly, you know, I'll probably do, probably do a separate episode of this podcast exactly on learning solos by ear, but just to quick, quickly, briefly tell you how I go about doing it is first, I'm going to listen to that solo a bunch of times so that I really have it in my ear, okay? Just really get it ingrained in my memory. And then what I'll do is I'll just start with the first little phrase. It might not even be the entire phrase. It might be half of the phrase, and I'll, and I'll play that. And then I'll keep repeating it. I'll have it on my computer, on my MP3 player, somewhere where it's easy to just keep scrolling back and listening and listening. And I'll make sure I have every note of that first phrase. And then I'll play it back with the recording. And then I'll repeat it a bunch of times so I just have it stuck in my memory before moving on to the next phrase. Um, so th that, that's how to go by doing that, you know, just a very short, brief explanation. I'll definitely do another episode in the future that really goes into this a lot more. Um, so it can be challenging and it can be a lot of work and it can take a lot of time. But in the end, this practice is incredible, incredible for learning, for, for learning jazz language. And it's going to open up your ear to new levels that you could never have imagined. And, and the ear is one of the most important things to have really strong when playing uh, jazz. Um, and, you know, find a solo that you really like. I think I mentioned that earlier. But for me, uh, he here's an example of one solo I learned. I learned um, John Coltrane's solo on My Shining Hour. Uh, that's on um, Coltrane Sounds, or Coltrane Jazz, I think, is the album that it's on. Um, it's such a great solo. I want you to have a, let's have a listen to it right now. Okay, so that was just the first chorus, but I love this solo. It was a solo that I absolutely got obsessed with. I, I used to walk around uh, my neighborhood in New York and just listen to that solo on repeat. I think I even, you know, edited a track so that, um, uh, you know, it was just literally his solo over and over and over again. And I, I really got that stuck in my ear and I, I learned... Um, just about all of that solo. I think for some odd reason, I, I didn't learn maybe the last A section, um, but I, I, I loved that solo and I learned pretty much every single chorus and, and really obsessed over it. Um, and the thing that I did next with that solo actually is going into my second uh, th uh, thing that I think all jazz musicians should practice. <laughs> Okay, so the second thing that I think every jazz musician should be practicing is to practice 
in all 12 keys, okay? Practice jazz language in all 12 keys. Practice, um, if you can, songs in all 12 keys. All of it is really good. And to build off of um, what I did next with that John Coltrane solo on My Shining Hours, I kind of went to the most obsessive level <laughs> that you can go with this, is I took that first chorus that you just listened to, and I actually learned how to play it in all 12 keys. And I know that sounds insane to some of you, or maybe ridiculous or unnecessary, and, and it may be all of those things. But I will tell you that it, it really helped me, and it really helped me get that solo stuck in my head. And that information kind of is able to subtly come out sometimes. It it's It's not that I'm able to recall that solo at any moment in time when I'm in the middle of playing. It, it, what, what happens is it more comes out of my subconscious or, or little phrases or little elements and it helps me, it helps me really internalize jazz language. And so practicing in all 12 keys is really important and you don't need to take a solo and bring it through all 12 keys. That's again kind of an extreme thing but take little licks or little musical ideas that you like and take it through all 12 keys. It can be a, a lick over a 251, over a 16251, or just over one chord, like a dominant chord. If you, you listen to a lick and you really like it, you can, you can learn that in all 12 keys. And there's a lot of things that, that learning in all 12 keys really helps you with. And, and the first thing it really helps you with is it really helps you solidify and get that stuff into your ear, okay? Because you're repeating it over and over and over again. And you're not just repeating it in the original key, you're repeating it in other keys. And, and each key will feel a little different, and, and it depends on the instrument that you play, but it will still feel different, you know, playing in a different key than, than the original key, for example. And it really helps build your ear. Uh, it really helps, you know, force you to you know, not rely so much on muscle memory or other things like that. It, it forces you to, you know, have to hear it in a different key. You know, have to understand how it works in a given musical situation. It helps decrease your limitations on your instrument. One key might be really weak for you versus another one. Um, for me, if I'm trying to play a certain idea in the key of B rather in the key of B flat, um, I'm a guitar player, so C instrument, that's it can be a little confusing for me because I'm not used to playing things in the key of B that much. You know, that's not a common key. B flat is a common key. So being a half step away can be a little confusing for me sometimes. So being able to practice in all these different keys really helps you uh, defeat some limitations on your instrument. Um, the other thing that, you know, taking things through all 12 keys does is it really helps you when it comes to transposing. Um, if you're ever on a gig, especially if a singer or, or it's a jam session and a singer comes up to play and they say that they want to play a, a particular song in, in some very foreign key from the original key, that's where a lot of musicians start kind of having mini panic attacks like, oh, I have to transpose that? How am I going to do that? Well, taking things through all 12 keys, it kind of forces you to start thinking that way, um, especially if you're learning you know, a, a particular maybe jazz standard in all 12 keys or at least multiple different keys. It helps you to really analyze that song, understand how the chord progressions work with each other, and it also helps you hear where those go. Um, so, so it really helps you with transposing. Um, so you don't need to take big pieces of information through all 12 keys. I think it can be more beneficial just to take like I said, small bits of information through all 12 keys, like little licks, little ideas. This is really going to open up the possibilities for you and really help you kind of take it to the next level as far as learning jazz language. So the third thing that I think all jazz musicians should be practicing is to work on keeping time with a metronome. And in both of the things I've talked about so far have been, you know, melodic stuff and harmonic stuff, but it's important not to forget the rhythmic aspect of playing music, okay? So working 
on keeping your time is so important. And I think the best way to do that is with a metronome. So I had some teachers um, at one point tell me, hey, Brent, everything sounds good with what you're playing. Like the, the lines are good, the information's good, and I like you know the, the, your voice on the instrument and all that stuff. But there's something just seems a little bit off. You know, it almost seems like you're rushing a little bit. You're on top of the beat and this and that. And I would go back and I'd listen to recordings of myself because I would do that a lot. And I would have to agree with them. Something sounded just a little bit off. And what I learned was that I indeed was rushing it a little bit. Um, I indeed kind of did learn that, you know, I wasn't always placing the beats exactly where they should be. Um, and, and it wasn't always in a tasteful way. So I, I had to kind of go back and, and start to work with a metronome to try to correct my time, build my inner clock, and really get my phrasing right. So this, this really helped me by just starting to work with a metronome. And again, I'll have a, a future episode of this podcast where I really go into talking about how to work with a metronome. But for now, I'm just going to kind of give you some, some quick tips of how to use a metronome. Um, so first of all, the way I use a metronome is, for me, the default is I have the click going on two and four, okay? Um, for me, that, you know, that helps me feel the strong beats myself, which is one and three. And having it on two and four, also if I happen to be playing swing, also will emphasize that swing feeling. But mostly it's just because I want that beat to be making me feel the strong beats of one and three. So I always have it default on two and four. Some people will disagree with me. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters as much, but I think it's important to, to kind of set your default for beats two and four. So if I start a practice session and I'm gonna work on, you know, just blowing over a song, for example, you know, practicing over a song, I'll have the beat on two and four. I won't have the beat on you know, I won't have the click on every single beat. That's just not necessary for me. Uh, two and four is kind of a good starting point for working with a metronome and kind of feeling out the time and where it's at. So set the default for two and four on your metronome. And what you want to do is after you really get comfortable at a certain tempo, you know, start with a very comfortable tempo. Like for me, it would, uh, you know, be a medium tempo. Try going to really slow tempos with the, the click on two and four and, and work your way down slowly. Um, you'll find that slow tempos are just as challenging as fast tempos and learning how to phrase, you know, properly at those tempos and really feeling, you know, the, the off beats and the strong beats and, and all this stuff and all the rhythms that you can play in between. And then work on going faster. Now faster, you know, tends to be uh, something for that, that challenges people's technique, you know, playing at these up tempos, but just start with a comfortable tempo and then slowly inch that speed up on the metronome um, until it, it, it gets faster and faster and it, and it pushes you maybe to your limitation before you kind of crash and burn. You can't go much faster than that. But that will really help you to phrase at that tempo as well as practices of, of how to play on fast tempos. Um, another, another topic we can talk about you know, all together in a new episode another time. Now, what you should also do is once you get used to practicing with the clicks on two and four, then switch it around. Try it on one and three, okay? This will help you start thinking about the time a little differently, okay? And, and it will feel a little different when you start playing and soloing. You'll, you'll feel like phrasing a little differently in a way. But it's going to be good for you to get that rhythm inside your body. And after you're done doing that, try something else. Try just putting the beats on beat two of every measure, okay? So every measure, there's only one click and it's on beat two and practice that. I guarantee you that'll be a lot more challenging because you're gonna really have to work on keeping that inner clock inside of you going and you'll be building a better sense of time by always having to hear and feel those beats yourself within your own body by the time the click comes around. And you probably will have a hard time with this at first if you're not used to practicing with a metronome. You might, 
you know, crash and burn a lot and really have to practice this. And I hope you struggle. It's a great thing. It will really help you. And I constantly have to bring myself back to the metronome and test myself and make sure that my clock is still working just fine. And if you really want a challenge, um, you know, go ahead, first of all, and, 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 and try other beats too, not just beat two, try just beat three, try just beat four, just beat one. But then if you really want a challenge, okay, try just one beat of every other measure. That's really going to challenge your time. But this is not something to be overlooked. You know, we always focus on making better solos or, uh, or for accompanists, accompanying better and harmony and theory and all this stuff. But so often we forget about time and how important time is. If you don't have good time and you're playing, everything will sound off. There will always be something missing and wrong. So start today, work on keeping time with a metronome, add it to your practice routine. I guarantee you it's going to do wonders for your music. All right, and that's all for our show today. We thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. And if you have anything else to add to today's discussion, anything that you think that jazz musicians should practice, or even just things that you're practicing now, uh, feel free to leave a comment in our comment sections below. Uh, if you're listening to this on the website, we'd love to hear from you. And again, if you've enjoyed this show, if you're getting value out of it, consider supporting us by leaving a donation at the donation button right underneath um, the player, or you can go to learnjazzstandards.com slash support to make a donation there. We thank you guys so much for listening. Next week, we'll be coming out with episode five of the Learn Jazz Standards podcast. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm.